for particular nice kinds of functions like linear functions, we have special answer checkers um, that are very robust and will generalize well to uh, higher dimensions, uh, multivariable settings. This question is about um, points and so forth. Um, so let's go ahead and make note of the fact that we're using the point context and we're using this limited point. Um, we could use this context limited point macro and the limited point context it provides. Um, what that would do would be to disallow operations between points. So for instance, you could think of a point plus a point as being an operation between points if you want students to fully reduce their answer and enter it as a single point, then you'll want to use that limited point context. Okay, so taking a look at this, I've got it commented out right now. We could uncomment that context limited point macro if we wanted. In the, the default setup, um, one thing you probably noticed in the graphing homework problem that I gave you at the end of uh, this morning session was that the context was numeric and we had to actually change it to point in order to get the answer to be interpreted correctly. So in order to get this, the answer checking to work on this problem, you will need to use, you will need to comment out or remove numeric context and use either one of these uh, point contexts. Um, other than that, there's not a whole lot going on in this problem that's all that special. Um, by declaring the point context, remember, we're ensuring that these parentheses are going to be interpreted properly as noting coordinates for a point rather than um, an interval, right, you could imagine. Um, you could imagine that uh, if you tried to use an interval context for some points, um, you could imagine combinations of A and B for coordinates of a point that would give you um, an interval that would be empty, and you wouldn't want that. So you want those parentheses to be interpreted correctly. You want the error message uh, and answer checking utilities to be all aligned. All right, a little bit of DEs here. So let's suppose that we've got, um, so whether we want the students to enter an answer that is in the form of an equation rather than an expression. Well, we can require that students enter it in the form y equals something or a function of the variable equals something uh, by using a particular uh, macro called parser assignment. And then after we've defined the context, um, we're going to allow the parser assignment, um, and that will give us this y variable requirement. Or if we add a, if we have a named function like g that we want to uh, be allowed, we have to explicitly tell it, hey, uh, I'm going to add g in this particular way to the context. Okay, so let's uh, let's go ahead and take a look at the source code for this example. Do a little code review here. So what's going on? That's interesting. Once we've defined the context, then we are um, using the features provided by that parser assignment.pl macro, and we're going to allow uh, general uh, expressions uh, involving the variables from the context. And if the variable is not in the context but is instead a function like g, um, we need to tell, we need to specify that in this way. Okay, so as far as constructing the correct answers, there's nothing special going on. They're just equations uh, rather than expressions. And as far as the answer checking is concerned, there's nothing special there either, right? We're just passing the answers in um, at, 
to the answer checker in the usual PGML way. Okay, now let's go back to the problem and let's think about this. e to the t over 1600. If we are to enter that expression, then we're going to get an error message that says, oh, your answer is not in the right form. So hopefully the student would read that and reread the question with its ex explicit instructions and say, oh yeah, I need to enter an equation. So let's try that. And we get the correct answer. Now down here I notice that y equals 1 is also supposed to be marked correct by this answer checker. Hmm. Very interesting. Last year when I did this workshop, I remember very explicitly that that was marked correct. Uh, perhaps the random value uh, for this number right here was larger when I did it last year. Anyway, uh, the point that I'm trying to make is that um, for values of t that are between negative 2 and 2, um, negative 2 over 1600 or 2 over 1600 is going to be very close to 0, and e to the 0 is close to 1. And so apparently with a large enough denominator here, you can in fact get y equals 1 marked correct, which is not what you want. So one thing that we should do to counteract that is to, of course, identify it as a potential problem and set the limits for uh, function evaluation. So if we remove this comment, uh, we can then modify the current context by setting the variable t to be evaluated between 1,000 and 2,000, and then with that change, uh, with that change, when t is between 1,000 and 2,000, this function is going to be highly non-constant. So we'll get a better answer checker there. It's also possible to provide students with um, general answer hints after a certain number of attempts, as well as specific answer hints when students enter particular answers. So for instance, if you've ever taught a calculus class, you know from experience that when you get to linear approximations, students will tell you that the linear approximation to a function is simply the derivative of f at a. Right? It's just the slope of that linear approximation. So um, I'm feeling lazy. Show me the correct answers. Uh, so the slope is 1 tenth. And if the student enters 1 tenth, then I've set up to give them a custom answer hint that says when a student enters just the slope, the message should be, hey, your answer should be an equation. And it should be for a non-horizontal line. OK, so maybe the student then realizes, oh, yeah, OK, I need an expression. Uh, or they think they need an expression, so they go ahead and submit their answer. Oh, your answer is not a variable equal to a formula that returns a number. It looks like a formula that returns a number. Hmm. So that's not a very clear message upon first read, but hopefully the student realizes then they should reread the question. Oh, the answer should be an equation in the variables x and y. OK, so then they're going to enter an equation. Maybe they don't know how to enter an equation, so they click this Help Equations button provided by the Answer Format Help. And it tells them equations look like this. And you have to do things in the correct way. And you can't do silly things like apply functions across an equation and, and all a bunch of other helpful things. OK, so a student reads that and realizes they need y equals and they submit their answers. And it's still not correct. Oh, yeah, I forgot the f of a. I forgot the starting height. 
f of a is 5, so starting height plus slope times change in x. Okay, good. So let's take a look at all the features for answer hints that are available. Um, there's a, for the specific answer hints for particular student answers, there's a macro called answerhints.pl. The general answer hints after a certain number of attempts by the student, uh, those are built right into PG. So once you've loaded the standard macros, uh, you've got the basic answer hints um, already defined for you. Okay, so let's talk about the basic answer hints first. Okay, so scrolling down here toward the bottom of the problem, we see this general answer hint section, and we set the value for the variable show hint. And by setting it to 2, we're saying that after a student has submitted two answers, then this link for a hint will pop up. Okay, and in the old style, you can use begin hint, end hint. With the new PGML, you use begin PGML hint and end PGML hint. And you can provide the students with some sort of guidance to how, how to solve the problem. Um, of course, I'll leave the actual instructions up to you. I decided to do it as a list. Um, so that's the general answer hints you can provide. There are also those specific answer hints, like for when the student enters just the slope. So I have bundled all that together in a Perl scalar called dollar sign answer. And dollar sign answer looks like like this. It, it takes the correct answer, which is this equation, and it's going to take that equation and evaluate it using the standard comparison method. Okay, so nothing out of the ordinary there. But then we're going to use a, a filter uh, that provides answer hints. Okay, so when the student enters either 1 over, um, I forget what the value of a2 is, 1 over 10, or when they enter y equals 1 over 10, then those two answers are going to receive the message, your answer should be an equation for a non-horizontal line. And um, this list here of answer hints can be much longer, uh, meaning I could take essentially these two lines and copy them and paste them in right here and add more sorts of answer hints like this. Um, this replace message set to true option is going to take any of the default um, error messages that, that math objects generate and replace them with your own custom uh, error messages to students when they type in these specific answers. So here's an example of a problem where we're going to use two different contexts, one for the domain and one for the range. So the answer checker for inequalities essentially converts things to intervals and then does the answer checking using interval answer checkers. And of course, in the process of converting from an inequality to an interval, you lose the variable name that goes with, um, with either the domain or the range. So what we're going to do is we're going to use two different uh, contexts, and in particular, this context, inequalities only, will specify that students must enter inequalities. They cannot enter uh, intervals. And so we'll use this special context called context inequalities. And um, we will require students to use only inequalities with the variable x as the only variable defined. Right, so if we use the keyword R here, that means that only those variables uh, in here that appear here are going to be in the context. If we use add, then we're going to add these variables to any variables that already exist in the context. OK, 
Okay, so now we've got a context in which the variable x is defined and it's the only variable. We're going to control the printing and formatting of the student answers a little bit and the answer is just an inequality for the domain and it's going to be an inequality in the variable x. Then if we reset the context by essentially calling for a new context in the variable y, we can have another answer um, that will require students to enter uh, their answer using the variable y and everything else in the problem is kind of standard boilerplate stuff. Let's go back and see how that uh, looks. Sorry for all these tabs I have open that I forgot were open. Um, so x greater than or equal to 4 and y greater than 0. It's intentionally wrong. I just want to see what happens. Okay, so the We'll get some warning messages, like the type of interval is incorrect. Oh yeah, I guess we can actually plug in zero to the square root function. There we go. So that's an example where you might want to enforce using inequalities, and you might want to enforce using specific variable names. Uh, and notice that when I changed it from x to y, the domain answer is no longer correct because it's not e the variable y is not even defined in that context in which the answer was defined. David did some introduction to the uh, numbers and formulas of the units, I believe, earlier in his math objects presentation. I just want to remind you um, there's a special parser for that. Uh, actually two special parsers, one for numbers and one for formulas. And the constructors are fairly obviously named and you'll specify some math object formula or uh, scalar that has a math object formula in it together with uh, the units. So let's see how that works in the problem source. Pretty straightforward. We load the two parser macros and then down in the setup section where we construct these formulas, um, you know, we do some derivative computations and uh, one of them is going to be a formula for velocity, one is going to be a velocity at a particular instant in time. Uh, each of those calculations has the same unit speed per second. And other than that, it's pretty boilerplate, right? This, there's nothing interesting or special happening in the PGML section of the problem. Uh, Antiderivatives, David also talked about these. We want to be careful when doing answer checking on these because exponential functions blow up. Um, there's a specific antiderivative for that if we added any constant to that, we would also get that correct answer. Um, these warning messages are not always 100% uh, perfect, right? Uh, obviously, what we typed in previously uh, is different from what we just typed in, but um, as far as answer checking is concerned, those are in fact equivalent. Um, if we were to type in uh, an arbitrary constant, then we're going to get an error that this is not defined. But in the next part where we're looking for a general antiderivative, then we do want that arbitrary constant. And if we were to leave it off, it's going to complain that we don't have the most general solution. Okay, so let's take a look at the source for that. It's actually pretty straightforward stuff. There's a parser for that called formula up to constant. And then in the setup section is where the interesting stuff happens. And it's really not all that hard. Um, we want a standard formula for the specific antiderivative for the uh, formula up to a constant. The general antiderivative, uh, we specify it in the same way. Okay, then in the answer checking, 
uh, for the specific antiderivative, we're going to have an answer checker uh, that checks that the student function agrees with the correct answer up to an additive constant using this context, sorry, not a context flag, but this answer checker um, flag up to constant set to true of one. And then uh, for part B, the general antiderivative, since we constructed that using the formula up to constant constructor, there's nothing special we need to do there in the answer checker. So we can just leave off the, uh, the comp method stuff. OK. Uh, now, for general linear equations, there is a very robust answer checker parser for that called parser implicit plane. Um, by default, it's in three-dimensional space. Um, and you can specify, I think in, in the most natural way, you can specify um, the answer using this very explicit constructor. Um, there are other options. You can pass this implicit plane function or constructor, uh, normal vectors, and a point on the plane, and things like that. So there are other options that you can check out, um, probably looking at the pod documentation. Um, this implicit plane parser not only works in two dimension, in three dimensions, but also in two and in higher dimensions. You just have to specify how many variables are in the context, and it will automatically do that for you. Okay, so we'll use this implicit plane, and then just maybe out of force of habit, I also loaded this vector utilities macro. I don't remember if we actually used it in this problem, but I loaded it anyway. Um, so if we wanted to have a very robust answer checker for a general equation for a line in two-dimensional space, then we could restrict the number of variables down to two, enter an equation that was that is only in two variables, and um, using the implicit plane constructor. And since we explicitly constructed it, there's uh, basically nothing fancy we need to do as far as answer checking is concerned. There are other uh, contexts, like the limited polynomial context provided by this macro that you can use to require students to enter their answer in a particular format, like this expanded format uh, for a polynomial expanded and simplified format. If we look at the source, it's pretty straightforward. We load the macro. That macro provides a certain limited context. And we're going to use the strict version of that context, which is going to require students to combine uh, combined terms, right? So this this uh, coefficient of the linear term in the answer is actually um, negative 2 times h. And we want students to explicitly um, you know, do that simplification. We want them to do the simplification for the constant term as well. Um, so instead of allowing students to enter the constant term um, as an expression with two terms, we're going to require them to simplify it down to one term by using this strict uh, option for the context. And because we used um, this context um, with a general formula object, there's nothing special we need to do for the answer checker. Right? David's done all the hard work for us by writing this uh, specialized context. Okay. Um, one other context you might want to use is this parser solution for context, which will provide you a way to uh, allow students to enter any number of well, any one solution to a particular equation. Okay, so it's got a, as usual, it's got a constructor. One thing that's a little unusual is how you actually get the formula for that equation out of the object. So in the problem text, and I guess I should have used, I should have updated this to PG, so I should have had um, square bracket back take here instead. Um, you're going to get the uh, the formula, ob the tech formula object from this um, solution for math object by using this um, particular method right here. 
So let's take a look at the source. Again, we load the usual macro uh, that provides the particular function we want. Um, I declared the vector context since it has x, y, and z as variables by default. And then I provided an equation together with one solution to that equation. Um, I printed the answer in the display, sorry, the uh, equation in the display to the student. And then the answer checking is all handled by the, um, by the solution for uh, parser. So nothing special is needed there. All right. I don't know how much time we have. Maybe, maybe time for one more. OK, so suppose that you've got a question where the answer could be different types of objects. right? It could be a number or a string. Those are fundamentally different types of math objects. And so you want to allow students to enter either one of those types and not get any warning or error messages uh, if they do enter a, a formula, I guess, in this case, or a string. OK, so the way to get around that is to, in the string answer, if there is a string answer, for instance, um, pass this flag type match, and then just any formula in the variable will let this type match um, will inform this type match option of what's going on. Okay, so that's, this will allow students to enter none, or maybe they enter some sort of formula. And if they enter a formula, they got the incorrect result, and they got no warning messages over here. Okay, so let's actually see that in action. There's nothing interesting to load here. Uh, we just have to specify that uh, when we check the answer, we compare it to, uh, well, in the comp method, we will allow for formulas as well as strings, right? So in the event that the randomization should choose the answer none, which is a string, then that string answer will get compared to uh, strings, of course, by default, but also when it gets compared to a formula. So if the student enters the formula in the variable x, uh, they're not going to get any error message from that. 